In this video lesson, we'll discuss the election of 1860 and the following secession of the southern states. The presidential election of 1860 was determined by the issue of peace or civil war. Deeply divided, the Democrats met in Charleston with Douglas as the leading candidate of the northern wing of the party. The Southerners regarded him as a traitor as a result of his unpopular stand on the Lecompton Constitution and the Freeport Doctrine. And the delegates from most of the cotton states walked out, and the remainder could not scrape the necessary two-thirds vote for Douglas, and so the entire body dissolved. The first tragic secession was the Southerners from the Democratic National Convention. The Democrats tried again in Baltimore, this time the Douglas Democrats, chiefly from, chiefly from the North, were firmly in control. The platform came out for popular sovereignty as a support to the South against obstruction of the fugitive slave law by the states. Angered Southern Democrats promptly organized a rival convention in Baltimore in which many of the Northern states were unrepresented. Their leader became the Vice President John C. Breckinridge from Kentucky. The platform favored extension of slavery into the territories and the annexation of Cuba. A middle-of-the-road group, fearing for the Union, hastily organized the Constitutional Union Party, which was sneered at as the Do-Nothing, or the Old Gentleman's Party, which consisted mainly of former Whigs and Know-Nothings. Desperately anxious to elect a compromise candidate, they met in Baltimore and nominated for the presidency John Bell of Tennessee. Republicans were presented with a heaven-sent opportunity for victory. They gathered in Chicago in a huge wooden structure called the Wigwam. William Seward was the best known of the contenders, but his radical speeches had ruined his prospects for president. Lincoln was definitely a Mr. Second Best, and he was a stronger candidate because he had made fewer enemies, and he was only nominated third on the ballot. The Republican platform had an appeal for just about every important non-Southern group, for the Free Soilers, a non-extension of slavery, for the Northern manufacturers, a protective tariff, for the immigrants, no abridgment of rights, for the Northwest, a Pacific Railroad, for the West, internal improvements at federal expense, and for the farmers, free homesteads from the public domain, in other words, land for the landless. Southern secessionists served notice that the election of Lincoln, the abolitionist rail splitter, as he was called, would split the Union, but he was no outright abolitionist. In 1865, he was inclined to favor cash, co cash compensation to the owners of freed slaves, but for the time, perhaps mistakenly, he issued no statements to quiet Southern fears. As the election campaign continued, Lincoln staged roaring rallies and, par and parades. Douglas himself waged a vigorous speaking campaign, even in the South, and threatened to put his own hands around the neck of the first secessionist. The returns proclaimed a sweeping vi victory for Lincoln in the election of 1860. To a greater degree than any other holder of the nation's highest office, Lincoln was a minority president. Only 60% or 60% of the voters preferred another candidate. He was also a sectional president. For in 10 southern states, where he was now allowed on the ballot, he polled no popular votes at all. The election of 1860 was virtually two elections, one in the north, the other in the south. Douglas made an impressive showing, boldly breaking tradition. He campaigned energetically for himself and drew important strength from all sections and ranked a fairly close second in the popular vote column of the entire 1860 election. If the Democrats had not broken up, they could have entered the campaign with higher enthusiasm and better organization and might have actually won the election of 1860. The verdict at the ballot box did not indicate a strong sentiment for secession. Breckinridge, while favoring the extension of slavery, was not a disunionist. The South still have five to four majority on the Supreme Court, and although the Republicans had elected Lincoln, they controlled neither the Senate nor the House. The federal government could not touch slavery in those states where it existed except by constitutional amendment, and such an amendment could be defeated by one-fourth of the states. The 15 slave states numbered nearly one-half of the total number of states. 
South Carolina had threatened to secede if sectional Lincoln came in, and four days after the election, the legislature voted unanimously to call a special convention. The convention met in Charleston in December of 1860. South Carolina unanimously voted to secede, and during the next six weeks, six other states of the Lower South followed South Carolina into secession. Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas. Four more were to join them later, bringing the total states up to 11. The seven seceders, formally meeting at Montgomery, Alabama in February 1861, created a government known as the Confederate States of America. As their president, they chose Jefferson Davis, a dignified and austere recent member of the U.S. Senate from Mississippi, and a former cabinet member who had wide military and administrative experience, but was suffering from chronic ill health. The crisis, already enough, was deepened by the lame duck interlude. Lincoln, elected president in November 1860, could not take office until four months later. During this period of uncertainty, before he was inaugurated, seven of the 11 deserting states pulled out of the Union. President Buchanan has been blamed for not holding the seceders in the Union by sheer force, for wringing his hands instead of secessionist necks. He was now nearly 70, and although devoted to the Union, he was surrounded by pro-Southern advisors. A proponent of the Constitution, he did not believe that the Southern states could legally secede, yet he could find no authority in the Constitution for stopping them with force. Old Buck was faced with a far more complex and serious problem. One important reason why he did not resort to force was that the tiny standing army of some 15,000 men, which were widely scattered, was needed to control the Indians in the West, and public opinion in the North was not willing to fight. Fighting would merely shatter all prospects of adjustment, and until the guns began to boom, there was still a flicker of hope of reconciliation rather than a contested divorce. When Lincoln became president, he continued Buchanan's wait-and-see policy. Impending bloodshed spurred final and frantic attempts at compromise. The most promising of these efforts was sponsored by Senator James Henry Crittenden of Kentucky. The proposed Crittenden amendments to the Constitution were designed to appease the South. Slavery in the territories was to be prohibited north of the 3630 parallel. But south of that line, federal protection would be given in all territories existing or to be acquired. Future states, north or south of the 3630 parallel, could come from the Union with or without slavery, as they should choose. Slavery supporters were to be guaranteed rights in the southern territories, as long as they were territories, regardless of popular sovereignty. Lincoln flatly rejected the Crittenden scheme, which offered some slight prospect of success, and all hope of compromise evaporated. For this refusal, he must bear the heavy responsibility, but he had been elected on a platform that opposed the extension of slavery. Buchanan probably could not have prevented the Civil War. Secessionists left for a number of avowed reasons, mostly relating in some way to slavery. They were alarmed by the tipping of the political balance against them. The crime of the North was the census returns. Southerners were dismayed by the triumph of the sectional Republican Party, which seemed to threaten slaveholding minorities. Weary of free soil criticism, abolition nagging, and Northern interference. Many Southerners supported secession because they felt sure that their departure would be unopposed. They were confident that the Yankees would not and could not fight. They believed that Northern manufacturers and bankers which were so heavily dependent on southern cotton and markets, would not dare to cut their own economic throats. But should war come, the immense debt owed to northern creditors by the South could be promptly promptly repudiated, as it later was during the Civil War. Southern leaders regarded secession as an opportunity to cast aside their generations being subordinate to the North. An independent Dixieland could develop its own banking and shipping and trade directly with Europe. The low tariff of 1857 was not at all menacing to them. Worldwide impulses of nationalism were fermenting in the South. This huge area, with its very distinctive culture, was not so much a section as a sub-nation. 
The principles of self-determination seemed to many Southerners to apply perfectly to them. Few, if any, of the seceders felt that they were doing anything wrong or immoral. In 1860 to 1861, 11 American states, led by the rebel Jefferson Davis, were seceding from the Union by throwing off the yoke of King Abraham Lincoln. We'll discuss the secession of the southern states and the beginnings of the Civil War in our lessons in class. <laughs>